Wait a minute, Hercule Poirot had a wife? Well, this is actually one of the most popular questions about the famous Belgian detective that people search on Google. Indeed, the guy was about 60 when we first met him on the pages and then the screens in the mysterious affair at Styles, so there should have been some love affairs throughout his long life. Perhaps there is something to do with Miss Lemon? Or what about that Russian countess he couldn't forget? The love of Poirot is his most well-kept secret. In this video you will find out everything about his love affairs, facts and rumors including. The young lady I spoke to you about, she's at table 5. Ah. Merci. She asked for you, specially. By name? By moustache. While Captain Hastings has multiple love interests alongside the show and Christie even married him and sent over to Argentina for a while, Hercule Poirot does always point out that he is not the one who falls in love. Of course, he was a fictional character after all and his marital status was never directly stated in any of the stories or books in which he was featured. In my experience, I have known of five cases of women murdered by their devoted husbands. Yes. And 22 husbands murdered by their devoted wives. However, there are some hints and clues in the books and the screen adaptations that let us deduce this intimate part of Poirot's biography. For example, do you remember his elegant boutonniere, the lapel pin he's always wearing with his suit for every occasion? We learn its story in the Chocolate Box series episode, where we dive into Hercule's Belgian past, where he was a young police officer in Brussels. There we learn that he received his iconic lapel pin from Virginie Menard. The pin was a type of a tossimassi, a small bouquet of flowers that is carried in a paper cone. It is also called a Victorian vase, since it was invented in the Victorian epoch. Suitors brought those tossimasses to young ladies, and the flowers symbolized various subtle sentiments. Later in the series, Poirot appears with a different set of flowers in it, yet Virginie Menard gave him these pale pink flowers. I'm not an expert in plants, not yet perhaps, but online image identification led me to the suggestion that is something like a pink taut flax flower here. I found that in the Victorian language of flowers, it was sent to ask someone to notice your attention and affection. So it is almost universally believed that Virginie was Poirot's first true love. I hope I haven't made things awkward for you. Okay. Not at all. Virginie. This relationship, however, didn't go further, although we are shown that Poirot met Virginie once more after discussing the case with Jap. Virginie was now married and had two sons, Henri and Hercule, the latter named after Poirot himself. How romantic and poignant at the same time, right? Well, the funny thing is, no such detail is mentioned in the book by Christie. According to the writer, although Virginie did indeed invite Poirot to investigate the case of the death of her cousin, she didn't become particularly close with the detective. In Agatha Christie's realm, Virginie was a very pious woman, and at the end of the story she entered a convent and became a nun. A little bit disappointing, right? Well, this love story with Virginie and this poetic lapel pin with minute flowers, it does fit Poirot, would you agree? So this edition of the series screenwriters is indeed spot on, as if Christie wouldn't mind it herself. A difficult smile to resist, eh, Hercule? Yes, indeed. If you think that the young lady and not the case attracted me, you do me a wrong clothes. At least this understatement in what happened next 
is so Agatha Christie, so in line with the sophisticated standards of the epoch. Toujours la femme, Chief Inspector. Are you for phrase in English which means the same? Uh, we just tend to say something like, mark my words, there'll be a woman at the bottom of it somewhere. Now, however, the British actor and film director Kenneth Branagh apparently has his own say in how it all evolved for young Poirot. As we learned in his Murder on the Orient Express, Poirot keeps a photo of his deceased love, Catherine. Ma chère Catherine, mon amour. Brana's recent adaptation of The Death on the Nile brings us another recollection of Poirot's past and presents the totally made-up storyline where Poirot got seriously wounded at war, yet didn't die, but he was brutally scarred. A small caveat, all stories about Poirot are of course made up, he is a fictional character. I just mean that this particular storyline wasn't part of Agatha Christie's creation. So, during that event we meet that very Catherine, who was Poirot's young fiancé, or even wife perhaps. She regularly visits him in hospital, yet then dies in a train crash. And her death is said to inspire Poirot to become a detective, because he needed something to distract him, and he has loved enough for one lifetime. And yes, his moustache is a direct tribute to that Catherine, since it was her advice to grow them to cover the scar. Simple. You'll grow a moustache. Well, in my opinion, that's a rather brutal invasion of Poirot's peculiar individuality, which is sadly totally in line with Hollywood's long-lasting struggles in portraying such characters. They just had to add someone from flesh and bone to define the character according to their canons. It reminds me of the deliberate extension of female roles in the Lord of the Rings. I'm not even saying that such a plot twist looks absolutely unlikable to Hercule Poirot's personality invented by Christie. And Poirot had quite a character indeed. Remember these first lines about him when we see him with the eyes of Hastings. Poirot was an extraordinary looking little man. He was hardly more than 5 feet 4 inches, but carried himself with great dignity. His head was exactly the shape of an egg, and he always perched it a little on one side. His moustache was very stiff and military. The neatness of his attire was almost incredible. I believe a speck of dust would have caused him more pain than a bullet wound. Indeed, he even once said that he finds it really insupportable that every hen lays an egg of a different size. What symmetry can there be on the breakfast table? Why do hens lay eggs of different sizes? It's not human enemy. These are two perfectly good oofs. Not surprisingly that a person with such a meticulous tidiness, attention to detail, a pedant, and one who sees everything and not a single faux pas would escape from his eye, well, such a man might perhaps be a rather overwhelming and insupportable companion in life. Why not? Perhaps there are women who search for exactly these features in their partners. Well, I suppose it had to happen one day. He's really quite taken, you know. Are you sure, Captain Hastings? You should have seen him. <clears throat> of course, Miss Lemon was precisely the one. Poirot's non-nonsense secretary did have a soft spot for her pedantic and eccentric employer. What an extraordinary personality mixed by itself. Alas, although we might go further in inventing the supposed level of Miss Lemon's affection for Poirot, it is absolutely crystal clear that there was no mutual feeling beyond respect from both sides, the detective and his secretary. Nothing, Mr. Poirot. 
Good night, Miss Lemon. Good night. She was also a pedant, no doubt, but the eccentric side of Poirot's character made him search for a more controversial and complex personality as an object of affection. Perhaps the ideal picture in his head was so unattainable that he hid it deep down in his mind with little hopes that one day someone would light this fire ever again. Many years and decades have passed until he met her. Good evening, Countess. It's an honor to have you with us again. Your usual suite is ready. When it comes to the second part of his life in England, Poirot evidently prefers to keep a low profile when it comes to anything even slightly related to the potential emotional attachment to any woman. He is often shown as an arbiter in Hastings' personal turmoils and even sorts out an unfortunate prospective match of Miss Lemon until falls in love with a criminal himself. In the Double Clue episode, there is this Russian countess Vera Rosakov, a very charming Russian lady, a member of the old regime. This story is one of Poirot's few encounters with the countess, his only acknowledged love interest. Here she first appears in Poirot's life during the investigation of a jewelry robbery. Amazingly, Poirot openly admits his admiration and fondness to this flamboyant and imaginative master thief, whom Hastings described as a somewhat disturbing personality. He wouldn't. Would he? I don't know. I've never seen him like this before. The most intriguing part is that Christie wrote the Countess being deeply involved in organized crime. What a woman! I tell you, Hastings, a woman who can accept defeat like that with a careless smile will go far. She's dangerous. She has the nerves of steel. It all reminded me of the paradox of Sherlock's affection for Irene Adler. Would you agree that there is something Victorian in making Poirot the brightest of the detective minds alive, the highly decent and noble soul, fall for a criminal? This sharp edge, uh, the direct juxtaposition of their roles, was very in line with an still growing passion for detective stories. It is the misfortune of small, precise men always to hanker after large and flamboyant women. Poirot had never been able to rid himself of the fatal fascination that the Countess held for him. You are the most remarkable, the most unique woman that I have ever met. But also... Opposites. Sisa. However, Poirot's admiration of Rostakov's and Christie's short story is the result of her behavior after he has identified her as a thief. Once again, Agatha didn't suggest that they went far from the deep and somewhat distant mutual affection. While in the TV series, the screenwriters decided to spice it all up and make them go on dates arm in arm in an art gallery or romantic picnic in the countryside. Barry is now calling Poirot Hercule, and in the end, he lets her go away with her crimes simply because she has his sympathy with her. So, not Poirot like, would you agree? Or perhaps do we all act irrational and not like us when we are charmed and seem to fall in love? Moreover, did you have that feeling that Vera was actually a perfect fit for Poirot? Both of them have left the countries due to the tragic events of war and revolution. Both of them managed to re-establish themselves in London. Both of them are very aesthetic-loving souls, very aristocratic, even not so in the means of blood, but in their nature and attitudes. 
Even Agatha Christie drops a subtle hint that perhaps she touched some hidden strings of the detective's soul when, in the end, he exclaims, A remarkable woman. I have a feeling, my friend, a very decided feeling. I shall meet her again. Where, I wonder? Have you been patiently waiting for their reunion too? Alternatively, could you actually imagine a man like Hercule Poirot, the world's most renowned detective, bothering for such a thing as a down-to-earth side of the marriage? I liked one comment at Agatha Christie's forum. Imagine how difficult it would be and how quickly it would become boring to the reader if Poirot had to stop and consider Madame Poirot, or even a mistress, before dashing off at a toute vitesse with Captain Hastings to solve yet another murder. Put the dinner in the oven, my dear. I shall be back when I have solved this little matter in Egypt. So thank you, no. The marriage it is not for me. Whatever it was in reality, uh, wait a minute, it's a fiction, not reality. Well, for better or worse, Agatha Christie preferred to keep that intrigue up to the final curtain. It's a shame you've never considered marriage, Mr. Poirot. There were occasions, Miss Lemon, when I did have la tentation, eh? the temptation. But now, alas, I think it is too late. Never pause unless you have a reason for it, but when you pause, pause as long as you can. Christy and her Poirot followed that advice from Julia Lambert from Moham's Theatre to the fullest. Poirot, he is not your love. He is... Poirot. Thank you for watching this bonus episode as a tribute to Hercule Poirot and the supporting characters around him. I'll make such episodes from time to time, so yeah, welcome to subscribe and see you there and in my other videos about no less curious characters and events of the past. Bye-bye!